You're listening to episode 47 of Liz's Healthy Table. Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great, too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. On today's show, I'll be joined by Chef Virginia Willis. Virginia is a Georgia-born, French-trained chef. She has cooked for all sorts of celebrities, not that I'm dropping names, but she's cooked for Jane Fonda and Bill Clinton. She's cooked for Aretha Franklin. Virginia's love of cooking started in her grandmother's country kitchen. And I'm kind of curious where your love of cooking started. And I hope you will share your story on the show notes from this episode. But more on that in just a minute. Back to Virginia. She is the author of the gorgeous new cookbook, Secrets of the Southern Table, a food lover's tour of the global South. She's also written several other cookbooks, including Lighten Up, Y'all, Bon Appetit, Y'all, and Basic to Brilliant, Y'all. I hope I'm saying that right. She's written a book called Okra and a book called Grits. She was the TV kitchen director for Martha Stewart. You're going to hear all about that on the show. And she is currently editor at large for Southern Living. Her fans love her down-to-earth attitude, and I know you're going to love listening to Virginia's interview today. You can learn all about her, follow her travel adventures at virginiawillis.com. So together on the show, we are giving away a copy of Secrets of the Southern Table to one lucky U.S. listener. So head on over to the show notes from today's show, lizishealthytable.com slash podcast to enter for a chance to win. And you can do that very simply by posting a comment at the end of the show notes. And just tell me about your favorite Southern food or your favorite Southern recipe Or tell me who inspired your love of cooking, or just tell me why you want to win the book. That, again, is at lizishealthytable.com slash podcast. So on the show, Virginia's going to take us on an eating tour through the South, 13 states to be exact. We will also tell you how to healthify Southern cooking for your family. We'll share some delicious recipes from the book, including this recipe for sorghum butter roasted spatchcock chicken. And if you don't know how to spatchcock a chicken, you will know that by the end of the show. We're going to give you a recipe for spiced sweet potato and pecan breakfast bread. And by the way, I used to call pecans pecans. Does anybody else call them pecans? I grew up in New York. That's what we said. But I did live in Atlanta for five years, and I quickly learned it's pecan. So we've got that delicious sweet potato pecan bread for you. And a savory sweet potato and greens gratin, which is something I suspect you're going to end up making for Thanksgiving this year. And we're going to talk a little bit about collard greens as well. Liz's Healthy Table is brought to you by my friends at superhealthykids.com. You are a one-stop shop for recipes, meal plans, cooking videos, and tips for feeding kids of all ages. My show is also brought to you by the Parents on Demand Network. This is an app filled with parenting podcasts covering everything from nutrition and feeding kids to pregnancy and raising toddlers. Check out the app and the lineup of shows over at parentsondemand.com. So I just want to warn you that after you listen to my interview with Virginia, do not be surprised if you suddenly start to crave okra. Virginia, welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So let's just dig right into Southern cuisine. You know, I want you to kind of define it for us because I think when people think about Southern food, they think about fried chicken, they think about biscuits or like, why is Liz doing this? She's a dietitian. So what is it? So the first thing to think about with Southern cuisine, you know, the South is this enormous place. So the food from South Carolina is different from the food of Georgia, which is different from the food of Louisiana. 
et cetera, et cetera. So there's the mountain south, the coastal south. That's the first point I think that's important to consider. The second thing that I so firmly and strongly believe in is it's early February and it's an unseasonable, but it's 70 degrees here. We have a 12 month growing season. So there's always something coming out of the ground or off the tree nearly 12 months out of the year. Now, what you say is true, however. Most people <laughs> think about you know, Southern food as fried chicken and biscuits. It is just one component of Southern food that has become very popular throughout the entire United States, frankly, because they taste so good. I could see that. But like you said, there's this year-round growing season. And, you know, it's funny because when I, I actually lived in Atlanta in 1987, 1987 to 1992, and I can remember driving up to the North Georgia mountains to go hiking, and it was so beautiful up there. And then there would be these sort of little roadside stands. So here in New England, you'd buy blueberries or, you know, corn. Up in the North Georgia mountains, it was boiled peanuts, boiled peanuts, boiled peanuts, and apple butter. I remember apple butter. And these were just foods like I had never really had before being from New York. So, but that's like the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's just, like you said, there's so much growing. We also think about peaches, don't we? Like when we think about Georgia specifically, we think about peaches. Right, right. And uh, there's like a collard green stand in my cousin's hometown in South Georgia, where this man like just pulls up with his pickup truck of freshly harvested collard greens, and that's all he sells. So, you know, it's a very agrarian society still. I think that the return to that is becoming more and more strong. So like when you were here in the late 80s, early 90s, no, you know, I don't think there was as much connection that people had from their food, where it came from with their farmer. And I think it's a trend that's prevalent across the whole entire United States. And the South is no different. Yeah, it's like that whole farm to table thing. So yeah. you say in your book, and we're going to get to your cookbook in a few minutes, but you say that Southern cuisine is a living, breathing, growing thing. And I love that because what you're really saying is that it's changing and that's okay, right? Because you've got people who've lived there for generations mm -hmm. in these 13 Southern states, but now you've got newcomers coming in. I mean, how does that all mesh? Like if you've got somebody from another country, they move to the South. How does that connection then start to kind of take place? Well, I think that the one thing I'd want to point out is that the South has been a home to immigrants since the very beginning. You know, there was a tremendous Italian and French settling in the Charleston area. Obviously, New Orleans is this sort of potpourri, this little gumbo of different cultures and cuisines. So there have been, you know, Anglo-Americans being here for hundreds of years but there also have been other immigrant populations in the South all along. And then now it's definitely the South is the fastest growing part of the country outside of California in terms of Hispanic growth. There's a tremendous Indian American population here in the Atlanta area. So that's the part where it's alive. I mean, it, it doesn't make it any less Southern. These people live here now and they're influencing local foodways. Right, right. That's so cool. So when you think about sort of this traditional Southern cuisine, mm -hmm. can it be, quote unquote, healthy? I mean, I'm guessing yes, because we've just talked about this 12 month growing season. But if you have a Southern kitchen, a Southern pantry, and you're like, okay, it's more than fried chicken and biscuits, like what are some of the, sort of the healthy superstars in that Southern kitchen? Well, I think that summer, like many places, I mean, summer is the time of the garden. So we've got corn and tomatoes and okra and butter beans and green beans and eggplant. I mean, you know, it's, it's a tropical climate, really. So there's fresh fruits and vegetables throughout the year. And, you know, there's a longstanding Southern tradition, even at diners, at the meat and threes, that you can just get a vegetable plate. So that's one of, you know, my favorite things to get collard greens and you know, okra and tomatoes and, you know, maybe with a wedge of cornbread and it's delicious. Now, you mentioned okra twice. Mm, uh, I, like okra. <laughs> I, I have to say it's like not my favorite vegetable. And so I need you to convince me to give okra a second chance. And all my listeners out there, if you are not an okra lover, let's listen up to Virginia. Let's get some good advice. What do we do with okra? Well, I did write a book on okra for UNC Press, and I think the first sentence of the line is that okra is a contentious vegetable. 
because people sort of love it or hate it. What I encourage people to do that aren't that fond of it, you know, the part that people don't like is that it's slimy. Yes. So the whole key is to lightly cook it. And one of my favorite ways to cook it is actually to grill it. And I feel like that's a good introduction to okra. You can grill it or broil it. And what I'll do is I'll sort of take the pods and skewer them like sort of in a ladder fashion, metal or wooden skewers, and maybe pop a slice of jalapeno every now and then between the two and just like a light coating of oil, salt and pepper, and then on the grill till it's bright green. And if you cook it until it's bright green, then that the slime factor doesn't come into play. And another thing that's good with okra to sort of minimize that is acid. So there's a reason that okra and tomatoes go so well together because that acid sort of minimizes that sliminess is what people don't like. It's so funny because like the word slimy is such not a good food word. <laughs> it's like, ew. It's horrible. Well, I have to tell you when I wrote that book, they didn't want me to use the word slimy. They wanted me to use the word mucilaginous, which I think is possibly <laughs> even a worse food term, you know? <laughs> that is so nasty. I'm like, <laughs> ew. <laughs> I think that people should give it a try. And then, of course, it isn't the healthiest thing in the world, but the true great gateway introduction to okra is a pickled okra and a martini. Hmm. Okay. Pickled okra <laughs> and a martini. I'm going to stick to the grilled okra to start. <laughs> That's good. Okay. That's going to be my little gateway. Of course, you know, here in New England, I probably am not going to find okra in the summer. I'm going to look around, but you know, you're probably not going to find it at the supermarket. I could be wrong, but if I find it this summer, I'm going to grill it and I'll be back in touch with you and let you know how it yeah. goes. No, it's actually kind of funny. I've noticed it, you know, because I do spend quite a bit of time in New England and I have noticed it more. And the secret is they use a lot of okra in Indian cuisine as well. And so if you can't find it at your stop and shop, you can usually find it at the local Indian market. Yeah. And we also have an H Mart. Mm -hmm. I live in Lexington, kind of right outside of Boston. And mm -hmm. we have an H Mart, which is a huge Asian market. So I think maybe I'll check that out. Yeah. All right. I've got a goal. I've got something to look forward to. I'm going to put it in my July calendar. So okra it is, and we're going to call it slimy and not mucilaginous because that is horrific. So let's go back in time. I want to hear a little bit about kind of how you got on this culinary path, because in your cookbook, Secrets of the Southern Table, you talk about growing up in your grandmother's kitchen and hanging out with your mom cooking and your grandfather and he had a garden. So give us a little bit of the backstory of how you became a chef and some of the cool highlights of your career. Well, thank you. I've always loved to cook. The kitchen was always the center of our household. My mother is still a great cook. My grandmother was an amazing cook and my grandfather had gardens. And so we had gardens. So I grew up with, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables coming in the door all the time. My mother was a very adventurous cook. So she cooked Southern classics like okra and green beans and corn and tomatoes and chicken and biscuits and all of that. But she also cooked crepes au champignon or made egg rolls or spring rolls and things like that. She's always been a very adventurous cook. And so it exposed me to a lot of things as a young girl. And although my family is from the Southeast, when I was basically a toddler, my immediate family, we moved to Louisiana. So I actually spent my elementary school years in Louisiana. And I love this story. Um, I only found this out a couple of years ago. So my mother was in her late twenties and didn't know anyone. She'd never lived so far away from home before. And so what she did to become familiar with this new home with a three-year-old and a six-month-old, she started, she purchased cookbooks, junior league cookbooks, and she started cooking the local food. So I grew up eating red beans and rice and gumbo and etouffee and jambalaya. I've always been exposed to a wide variety of foods. Hmm. I love that. And I think you say in the book too, that your grandfather had like a football field size garden. So I could see why your mom was inspired. Yeah. He always had a truly enormous garden and they preserved. So my grandparents came up during the depression and, you know, the South has always been very poor and has always been very rural. So people grew their own food. I mean, even if it wasn't 
necessary to feed the family. It always was augmented the groceries. He had a patch of corn by the river and it was just, they preserved jellies and jams and canned green beans. And it was just the food and the preservation of food and fresh food has always been a tremendous part of my life. And I feel very strongly that that's how it became my career. Hmm. Nice. I like that. I do think a lot of it is growing up at your mother's apron strings or the grandmother, the grandfather. And even for me personally, my mom was a home ec teacher. And so I spent a lot of time cooking in the kitchen. Interestingly, my sisters were very picky eaters and had no interest at all in cooking or even food. And it's just funny how kind of your DNA, maybe you're kind of programmed for it. I don't know, but it's kind of cool when you look back like that. And I'm also curious about family dinner. Like what was the family dinner like for you? Because I'm a big proponent of it. I think it makes a huge difference in our lives. So what did family dinner look like in your house when you were growing up? Well, during the weekdays, we all sat together and the TV was off. Not overly strict upbringing, but fairly strict, I guess, in comparison maybe to more modern day life, you know, it's yes, ma'am and no, ma'am and mm-hmm. yes, sir and no, sir. And you sit at the table and your hand is in your lap. And, and, but I remember, I have a very vivid memory of my grandmother, for example, teaching me how, as a little girl, teaching me how to eat a fish with my knife and fork that was served on the bone. And I have a really vivid memory of that about, you know, it's respect for the food. I believe that that sort of politeness and manners, it's very Southern, but it's also, I feel like it's respect for the food. It's respect for the hoops prepared it. It's respect for the farmer who grew it to sort of, so family dinners, Sunday suppers were of course like the big one, the big meal after church on Sunday was always this, you know, really robust meal with lots of different vegetables and things like that. So I do agree with you, Liz. I think it's family dinners are hugely important. And I will say, too, for people who are listening, that even if you can only get the family around the table once a week, maybe it is a Sunday supper. I like what you just said, Virginia, about this concept of just respecting the food, being polite, because there's so many elements and layers that go into getting that meal on the table. That If you're polite and lovely at the table, it does show respect. I think those are good life lessons. Yeah. Even if it is that one day a week, you know, we tend to kind of beat ourselves up oh, I can't get my family around the table, even if it's once, you know, or twice, like little baby steps. No, yeah, for sure. I think there's a commercial now and it's for some internet thing in the house, but they shut the internet off. And so everyone knows to put their devices down and they go to the table. And I think it's a genius advertisement. And I love that because you're right. Even one day a week is going to make a difference in your life. Okay, so here's my challenge to you, cookbook author extraordinaire. You walk in the door, you've got a bunch of hungry kids at the table. What would you make for a family? You know, if you walk in the door and you live in the South and you pull out all those great foods out of your pantry, give us a really great weeknight Southern family dinner. Oh, wow. Well, I'm a big proponent of sort of skillet suppers and one pot meals. And I think that it's easy on the mom or the dad that's doing the cooking. One of my favorite things to do is to... uh like in the fall, it's a good fall and winter dish is saute some sort of greens. It might be cabbage or collards or something like that. And also to use like boneless, skinless chicken thighs. I'll sear the thighs first with a little bit of salt and pepper, maybe a little bit of Creole seasoning, and then take the thighs out, do a little sort of greens and vegetable stir fry, pop the thighs back in and pop it in the oven. And it's sort of like a one pot meal. And then I think, I don't know, it's like, I don't want to just keep harping about okra, but my <laughs> my friend Evan, his son is, I think Grant is now nine years old and his favorite vegetable is okra and he loves it broiled and grilled. So I believe that what children are exposed to, if they're exposed to a variety of fruits and vegetables and things like that, that they'll grow more interested in them. You know, I do have some friends that have children and they only eat sort of, you know, brown food or sort of blonde food. And there's this sort of myth that, you know, kids are only going to eat chicken nuggets or something like that. And, you know, the work that I do in meeting different parents and chefs who are parents and their kids, you know, I've seen a three-year-old do an oyster shooter. So, you know, I just feel like you got to try it. I always think that's a good sort of attitude. Like if it's on your plate, you have to try it. Not this like old school, you have to finish it. I don't think that food should be punishment. 
but you know, just, you know, making something, you know, bright and colorful that the kids are going to like to eat. Like okra. I love that. <laughs> And maybe too, I mean, you do a lot of cooking classes. I've been at many of your cooking demos over the years. And that whole concept of getting kids cooking, the hands-on, like any tips for parents just from your experience? Like what are some recipes or a recipe that you think is really conducive to kids cooking? Oh, well, let me see. I'm trying to think of anything that sends secrets to the Southern table. But I think that it almost doesn't even matter what it is, whether it's like, you know, pancakes or chicken fingers, you know, I mean, part of it is getting their little hands in it. And it becomes more than just a cooking class. It's the lessons in social studies or, you know, just the engagement and the involvement, I think is what's so important. And then, you know, but like if kids like going out having taco night, right, there's no reason that you can't have taco night at home. And in the process, do a little few tweaks and changes to make taco night more healthy. Yeah. And you could even start with like the basic taco recipe that you know your kids love, and then you kind of tweak it a little bit, right? Little changes. Try some new flavors. You had mentioned Cajun seasoning before. What mm-hmm. what goes into Cajun seasoning? So there is a little bit of heat often in Creole seasoning, but usually it's cayenne and white pepper, black pepper, thyme, brown sage, salt. It doesn't have to be that, that hot. There are some brands that are Obviously, some are hotter than others. And it's actually quite easily made in-house as well. And I don't know. I think a lot of kids, it's, it's just the right amount of heat, not too spicy. But that may be because I grew up in Louisiana. Mm. <laughs> Maybe your taste buds are immune to it. I know I grew up, my mom was a home ec teacher, like I said, and much more, I would say her cuisine was more sort of classic French kind of cuisine or Italian. And I have the wimpiest palate, I must say. I love food. I love exploring. But if it's too hot and spicy, I can't taste anything else. I'm like, well, I don't like it. It's what we're used to. So Secrets of the Southern Table, that's your new book, A Food Lover's Tour of the Global South. I love that, Global South. And I've been pouring through this book. And it's so funny because when I was reading it, I was just thinking, my husband, we have a Tesla. He is completely obsessed with doing this like grand tour of the U.S. He's from England, so he hasn't seen like a ton of the U.S. And he wants to like drive and tour and, you know, he wants to go golfing. I'm like, I don't really want to go golfing, (laughs) but I'm reading your book and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like you could literally take your book and turn this into a 13 state tour because in the book, not only do you give us recipes, but you take us to farms and to visit local producers. And it's just like, it's such a celebration of the South. So tell us a little bit about the book and how it's more than just recipes, although we will dig into some of the recipes pretty soon. Yeah, no. So it really is this, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like a love letter for me. But at the same time, I learned so much, even living in the South as I have much of my life and traveling a lot through the South for most of my life. You know, Angie Mosier, who's my photographer and I, she and I did go to 13 states over the course of four seasons to visit different harvesters and producers and makers. And it was very intentional that I planned the people and that I wanted to show the diversity. So it was important for me to include Asian Americans or Asian Southerners and Hispanic Southerners. And I wanted to make sure to include a variety of ages you know, that, so for example, the average farmer state of Georgia is a 57 year old white male. So I wanted to include a young farmer. I wanted to include some younger farmers that are in their twenties. And one of the stories that's set in Virginia is about Diane Flint, who was a former, you know, CEO with Wachovia and is retired and is making this beautiful cider, but she's an older person. So it was really the whole concept of those stories was just to try to share with people the South that I know exists, because I think that a lot of people outside the South, they don't see that. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't see the diversity. Frankly, I think that often people only see black and white in the South, and they only see that those two races don't get along. And it's just simply not always the truth. It is a truth for some people, but it's not a truth for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you also break the book up into chapters. You have 
the garden. You've got grains, grits, and other starchy goodness. You have gospel birds and game birds. So of course, when I got to that chapter, I stopped and I said to myself, what is a gospel bird? (laughs) I'm such a Yankee. I am such a Yankee. Tell us, what's a gospel bird? So, and this is the truth. This isn't like something I like picked up off of the internet. My grandfather used to call it gospel bird because we would have chicken on Sunday. And so, of course, you know, the gospel of Mark's John, the New Testament is the Gospels. And so gospel bird is chicken. (laughs) Okay. We call that poultry. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's great. So you've got your chapters, you're visiting with farmers and producers as we kind of weave our way throughout these chapters. And I'm always curious, and I always ask authors this question, and maybe it's not a fair question, but do you have a favorite recipe in the book or does that kind of depend on the season? I think it depends on the season, but I will have to say that one of my hands down favorites in the book is actually the spatchcock sorghum chicken. So I think if there's one thing that cooks need to know how to make, it's how to roast a chicken. And so this is a combination. It's actually quite simple. I do suggest to brine it. If people have time, I suggest that people do a a quick brine, which is going to make the chicken more moist. And then the recipe itself goes through the technique of teaching someone how to spatchcock it, which I know that you know what it is, but for listeners that might not be familiar, it's simply cutting the backbone out and then opening the chicken sort of like a book. And it, what it does is it allows for the chicken to cook more quickly, which I think is always a bonus in the kitchen. You know, we're always sort of uh, scrambling to put dinner on the table. And so this can trim approximately 15 minutes off the cooking time. And then the last part of this, and we have shot it and I, I have access to sorghum here, but I've also tested the recipe with honey. So it's a combination of a little bit of butter and smoked paprika and honey or sorghum. And then once the chicken is about three quarters of the way through cooking, simply brush the, that smoked paprika mixture on the chicken. It's just simple and delicious. And it's like five ingredients, including the chicken. So that is one of my favorite recipes. Nice. Well, I'll have to give that a try too. Yeah. And of course, on the cover of your book, you have a recipe for smashed fried okra with spicy Mm -hmm. yogurt dipping sauce. So maybe that's my first okra recipe Mm -hmm. because we're not really in grilling season yet here in chilly New England. Yeah. I have a balance, I think, of the classics. I mean, I've got cat head biscuits on that cover too. Mm -hmm. I wanted to not only show the diversity in the stories with the people that are the subjects of the stories, I also felt it would be important to show the diversity in the recipes. You know, it once again, it's like, even though the South has this reputation for fried chicken and biscuits, I mean, it's just no one eats that every day. And not only that, there's different sort of populations throughout the South, you know, Greeks in Birmingham, Italians in New Orleans. There have been Chinese living in Mississippi since the 1800s. So I wanted to have some of those recipes in there, too. So, you know, you might not think that char suey pork tenderloin is a southern dish that you would find that in Mississippi, but guess what? You do. Hmm. I, as I went through your book, was somehow gravitating to anything with sweet potatoes. And I made your spiced sweet potato and pecan breakfast bread. And I also made your savory sweet potato and greens gratin, which is like something I will be making for Thanksgiving this year. But I thought maybe we could pop over to that spiced sweet potato and pecan breakfast bread and just kind of tell everybody how to make it because it's so easy and it really does celebrate sweet potatoes, which is a incredibly nutritious recipe or rather an incredibly nutritious vegetable from the South. We, uh, I mean, sweet potatoes are are very Southern and I'd like to just sort of take this moment to say that one of the things that is so important to Southern cuisine were the contributions that were made from African Americans, from Africans, from formerly enslaved Africans. And sweet potatoes were a core part of that diet, and they have remained in the diet, right? So, Mm -hmm. and then also Dr. George Washington Carver did a lot of research with sweet potatoes. And it was not only for nutrition, but also to help the farmers be more economically sustainable as well. So Mm -hmm. sweet potatoes are a cornerstone, I think, of Southern food. And I love that bread. It is a nice breakfast bread. It's a great recipe. And 
so basically, just so everybody knows, for the recipe, you need one sweet potato, and you cook that sweet potato. And I'm going to ask you right now, how big should that sweet potato be? Not, you know, some of them can be, be as big as a football. <laughs> I would say something about just like the size of like a regular like russet baking potato. Yeah, like eight ounces or something. Yeah. And then you need one and a half cups of whole wheat pastry flour. And for people who can't find it or don't have it, could you do a mix of white and whole wheat? Yeah, I think the whole wheat pastry flour isn't as readily available. That's a flour that I wound up using a lot with my previous book, Lighten Up, Y'all. But one of the increasingly available, there is white wheat. You know, like I think hmm. King Arthur makes a white wheat. And there's a couple others that have the whole grain benefits, um, but aren't just simply plain all-purpose flour. So I would suggest either doing a blend, as you were suggesting. I agree with that. Or looking for the, one of these whole grain white wheat. Yeah, Good. And that you do find. That's probably easier to find. Mm -hmm. And then you need baking soda and sea salt. I probably used kosher salt because that's usually what I have. Ground cinnamon, nutmeg, cardamom, which is really delicious. Mm -hmm. Black pepper. This is interesting. Ground black pepper. And then you need some brown sugar, unsweetened applesauce, eggs, chopped pecans, one of my favorite nuts, and some flaxseed. And it's a super easy bread, absolutely delicious. And as I do with many of my recipes, you know, Tim and I are living at home. We're empty nesters. But whenever any of my either Josh or Simon come home is like usually what I really start to cook. Mm -hmm. And a bread like that would probably last a day in <laughs> my house. So portion sizes are kind of a moot point in the Weiss household. I think that quick bread would very readily adapt to a, a muffin or a mini muffin too. Ooh, which would also last about a day in my house, but yeah. Quick bread. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> I love to eat seafood and I was looking at, and the one seafood I don't cook a lot is scallops mm. and you have a recipe for seared scallops with radish and candied jalapeno, which I thought was really interesting because I wouldn't think sour because, you know, in New England, scallops are huge, right? It's like a big part of the culture, the cuisine here. But how does this blend in with the sour? So we are more well known for bay scallops. Bay scallops grow in the Apalachicola region off the panhandle of Florida. So mm. sea scallops are a little bit less so. That's one of the more chefy recipes in the mm. book. You know, I think it's just looking towards, once again, the diversity of the South. We've got some incredible, like, world-class restaurateurs here. And the candied jalapeno is just a little condiment that I like to put on anything because it's that sweet heat. And I just wanted to share a recipe that might be a little bit more, like I said, chef-inspired for folks. Good. That's fun. I mean, I think it's good too with cookbooks because you can sort of go outside your comfort zone a little bit and try new things. And it's always good to have a cookbook as your guide. The other recipe that I made, the savory sweet potato and greens gratin. You want to just tell everybody what's in that? I want to just mm -hmm. kind of like dig deep into collard greens for a few minutes when we kind of go through the recipe, because I think people don't really always know what to do with collard greens. And does it take like three hours to cook them? So just tell us about the recipe. And then let's talk sure. a little bit about those nutritious collard greens. So there's two parts of this. So this recipe uses sweet potatoes. If someone wanted to substitute that out, then um, the only other suggestion that I would make would be to use butternut squash, which is also easy. And this is a, it's just a delicious recipe. And this recipe generated from a recipe that we did when I was with Martha Stewart nearly 20 years ago. But her version was a good deal of butter and cream. And over the years, I've adapted it. And my stepdaughter is gluten intolerant. And there's a couple other things. So this has become like a Thanksgiving dish that I can use a fava bean flour instead of all purpose flour to make the gravy. Mm -hmm. And it just winds up being this like super savory. The sweet potatoes are rich and creamy. The collard greens are umami. It winds up with this like sort of luxurious gravy. And then you sort of bake it all together and top it with some panko and a little bit of Parmesan. And it's just one of those super comforting side dishes. And you've got thyme, fresh thyme, which to me is so wintry and perfect, perfect for Thanksgiving. So before I ask you what you did for Martha Stewart, because now I know everybody's like, what? She worked for Martha Stewart? <laughs> but don't let me forget to ask you after I ask you about the collard greens. Uh -huh. And so if you're at the market and you see a bunch of collard greens, give us like three quick things we can do with collard greens. 
Oh, sure. So this recipe calls for a bag because I realize that not everyone has the life that they can, you know, pick up collard greens at the farmer's market. But I often will keep a bag just because I'll just grab a handful and saute them. Old school Southern collard greens would be cooked for an hour and more, more than likely be cooked with a ham hock or a piece of uh, smoked pork of some sort, bacon, bacon grease. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to, right? So there's another recipe in this book that's truly also one of my favorites. And I make a sort of a tomato broth using the rind of a piece of Parmesan. So the umami is coming from the Parmesan. It's a little bit more heart healthy and just cook the collards until they're just tender. And so they have a little bit of toothsomeness to them. Collard greens, actually, I think I don't want to dip too much into your area of mm -hmm. expertise, but I did an article last year for Southern Living and Collard greens write higher nutritionally than kale. I can believe that. Yeah. Yeah. They are good and good for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You actually did a Facebook Live with Ellie Krieger, who's been on the show I before. Yes. And I loved it. So, you know, when I saw the Facebook Live, you were cooking that collard green recipe. And I thought, oh, I need to have Virginia on the podcast because I don't know if I didn't realize that the book was out or what. So that's kind of that's kind of got the ball rolling for me. And just so people know, Virginia and I go way back, and I don't even know when I first met you. Probably, I don't either. Maybe at a nutrition conference, you might have been doing a cooking demo for someone, or I used to go to Atlanta a lot. Well, I used to live there, but I used to do a series of cooking videos for CNN's Accent mm -hmm. Health channel, it ran in doctor's offices, and I would do these meal makeovers cooking videos. And you, Virginia, were on the set for at least one or two shoots doing all the food styling and the prep. So that was probably another way we got to know each other. And Carolyn. I thought Carolyn. Her, I yeah. O'Neill. Yeah. Yeah. And Carolyn O'Neill, who I worked with at CNN, who's a dear friend, she has not been on this podcast yet, which is kind of remarkable. So I need to have her on the podcast. So anyway, I've, yeah. So Virginia and I go way back. But even before I met you, Virginia, you worked for Martha Stewart says you just drop that. So tell us, <laughs> darling, what did you do when you worked for Martha Stewart? Sort of breeze through this quickly. My first job cooking was as an apprentice on a TV cooking show with Natalie Dupree in the early 90s. And this is before I went to culinary school. So I apprenticed with Natalie Dupree for a couple of years, went to culinary school, got out of culinary school and lived and worked in France at a cold de cuisine laverin. And I was an editorial assistant for Anne Willen, who wrote Lavrin Practique and like 39 other books. <laughs> and then when I returned home from France, I became the kitchen director for Martha Stewart's television series. And the, the concept of the kitchen director is basically you're in, it's the chef, you're in charge of all the food on the show. So regardless of whether it was that little bowl of kosher salt, the immediate right of the stovetop or the sort of perfect cookies coming out of the oven, I was responsible for them. I may not have made them myself, but I was responsible for making sure that actually happened. And then let's see, after Martha Stewart, I was a senior television producer with Epicurious. Epicurious.com used mm -hmm. to have a TV series on the Discovery Channel. And then I, a little over, about 15 years ago, I moved back to Atlanta and I've just been I've been doing my own thing. And doing I, your own thing, yeah. Yeah, and I've, all of the experience comes into play with what I do today. And I still do writing and food styling, recipe development, lots of different things. A little less food styling than before. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine how stressful that Martha Stewart job was, though. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you're not A plus 100%, you have no business being there. And wow. She's super clear about that. But, you know, I have to tell you one of the, and I think that this explains a lot. So... Even though I was the, you know, the head of the kitchen, the person in charge of all the food on this, you know, multi-million dollar show, it was my responsibility to go to the Union Square Farmer's Market and pick up the groceries on Wednesdays and Fridays. We didn't send someone lower on the totem pole to do the grocery shopping because what was so important, the ingredients, respect to the ingredients and the perfection of the ingredients was paramount. And so that was really a wonderful part of my job. And I think it also shows a clear picture about like how Martha feels about things. Mm. I will bet that every farmer at that market got to know you very well. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, it's Martha. It's a good thing. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> 
So that's super interesting, yeah, about Martha Stewart. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall, just to see what you did in a day. I can only imagine. That's a lot of great experience, though. So back to the book, though. I just want to talk a little bit about peaches and dessert, because in the summer, of course, if you eat a beautiful peach, to me, that's enough for dessert. But I know you've got a peach recipe in the book. I actually think it's the last recipe in the book is this most beautiful peach. I'm opening it now. Peach upside down cake. So is that kind of like, tell us about that recipe, because it's so gorgeous. And I want to make it now, but the peaches are just not great right now. So there's no way I'm going to do it now. No, and this is our rich, beautiful, and decadent, that's for sure. So upside down cake was typically made with pineapple. That's sort of old fashioned southern dessert. Probably originated like I think in the in the fifties though, sort of mid century. But people love it. And so I've done them before with fresh pineapple and then I had an assignment a couple of years ago that was for peaches and I just decided to try this and it's a really nice moist cake. I do suggest that people use cake flour, which makes it lighter. I mean, you, people can find it usually Swans Down as a nationally available brand. It has a generous quantity of butter <laughs> and sour cream. Okay. So this is definitely a rich, indulgent dessert, but it's beautiful. And, and if you use the peaches in the season, not too soft, not too firm, you know, it does make for a lovely cake. I am going to try that. So okra and peaches are the peach upside down cake on my list for this summer. See, I've got so much to look forward to. What's next for you, Virginia? Any other cookbooks in the works? Like, what are you up to? Yeah. One of the things that's happened for me is that this book and some of the okra book that I wrote and also the Grits book for Short Stack has allowed me to sort of step outside my box a little bit. So I'm very grateful and thankful for being, you know, recognized on some levels as being like a Southern food authority but obviously I eat more than Southern food and cook more than Southern food. And I love to travel. So I'm working on a book proposal now that I hope to start working on the book shortly. That will be my first nationwide focused book. It will or more international. Actually, it will be more than simply Southern. So Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that. I think it's important regardless of whether you're a cookbook author or whatever you do, you have to keep yourself stimulated And it's important to grow and change and stretch. So that's what I'm working on. I feel like it's the next level. And I've been really happy with my box of Southern cooking, but I'm ready to turn my box into a step. Nice. I like that. Oh, I like that. Turning your box into a step. Yeah. That's cool. Well, I've been wanting to, (laughs) this is going to sound so weird, but I really have always been very intrigued by glass blowing and hold me to this, but there's a glass blowing studio in Boston. And I want to go even just to like observe because I'm just so intrigued. I don't think I'll ever become a glass blower. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's my destiny, but it is good. I agree with happy. you. you Got to shake it up, right? Yeah, it's important. I mean, otherwise you're just, yeah, we taste and adjust for seasoning with our food. And I think that sometimes we need to taste and adjust for seasoning with our life. Mm. And that's a good lesson for parents too with kids that every step is a step, right? Like, you know, you don't need to be stuck. My kid doesn't like vegetables. You'd be surprised. Try new things, right? And that Southern table, it's all there for us, right? Yes. So Virginia, where can people find you on the web? Oh, everything's at my website, virginiawillis.com. And there's links to all the social media channels and I have a blog and all of that information. So at virginiawills.com. And there are also links there on where to purchase my books, including Secrets of the Southern Table. And I will, in the show notes, provide links to all of your social media, your website, your book on Amazon. And we are running that giveaway for two weeks. U.S. listeners only, please. But one lucky winner is going to own your beautiful cookbook. So Virginia, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh my God, it was fantastic. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. So many things for me to look forward to, and I'm going to be sure to keep you and my listeners posted on my my Southern food adventures. So thanks again, Virginia. And thank you, everybody, for listening today. If you love the show, post a review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. Tell a friend about it. And as always, thanks for listening to Liz's Healthy Table.